The 1980s was a time of great ambivalence when it comes to me and the telephone network. Yeah, it's true. You see, my love of the phone network pretty much ended around 1979, but I continued to discover things with the phone network here and there and record them through late 1987, but it was all very obligatory. Occasionally things would happen. In 1983, the ESS bugs, for example, required a whole new level of research, and ironically, my greatest hacking coups were all during the 1980s, a time when my attitude about the network was rather ambivalent. But never mind. Here's a recording from February 1986, where a new cocot, or actually a line of cocots, appeared on Piedmont Avenue just north of Ponce de Leon in Atlanta at a gas station. The company that ran them was a company called NTS. I'm sure they're gone now. But these were the first cocots that Les and I ever saw that made a serious attempt to comply with the local phone company tariffs. COCOT, customer-owned coin-operated telephone. This was the old term for a private payphone, which, of course, was a new alternative to most payphones at the time, which were owned by the local phone company. Private payphones began as a rather shady business, at first being sold to unsuspecting customers not realizing they were illegal, and they often cheated the user of the coin phone by charging too much, not allowing access to long distance or other phone companies, not allowing you to use your touch tones to control your answering machine, which is one of the main reasons for calling from a payphone, and so on. So, after Cocots had already been installed, then there was lobbying to get the utility commissions in the states to approve them, and so they did, and there were various states that allowed them, and some had rougher tariffs than others. Some had good enforcement mechanisms. Well, probably none of them were good enforcement, but anyway, there were tariffs in different states, some totally unenforced, some partly enforced. Mostly, though, the cocot manufacturers were pretty much allowed to get away with murder. Now, this company actually tried to do it right. You could actually make long-distance calls from coin phones with operator assistance. So that was actually quite a big deal because they had to make local operators to handle long-distance, and this is probably the best example of COCOT compliance with the State Utility Commission rules that I've ever seen. Now, as I said, in the 1980s, I'm rather ambivalent about the phone network. And so in this recording, you can tell that I'm sort of rushing through it, not missing a beat, but trying to get it over with. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, let's do this. In the process, I had some good laughs with Les, but it was something we just did on this one day, and then we both forgot about it and never even used those cocots again. The first part of this recording is recorded from the payphone itself. That's me at the payphone recording what's happening. I'm trying various things with the tape running, including using their operator system. At that time, I discover that the operators are controlling collect and return at the coin phones by pressing keys on their board that produce an MF tone which talks to the phone. Hold on just a second. Okay, sir, you need to hang up and your money will return. Now, the system NTS was using was different from that used in the real telephone network. In the real telephone network, the MF tones are used for collecting, returning, and ringing back payphones. The tone was used on the trunk from one CO back to the other. That would be picked up by trunk equipment in the originating CO that you were calling from, and then the CO equipment would send the appropriate DC or ring signal to your payphone, and the actual high voltage signal would collect, return, or ring back your phone. Here, the tones are used from the operator's board to talk directly to the payphone. And rather than collecting or returning the coins right away, they simply tell the payphone to collect or return when the caller hangs up at the end of the call. And they are not the exact MF tones used in the regular network at this time in the 1980s. So that's one thing I do need to explain. February 22nd, 1986, a um, new cocot has appeared. This one is really unique, as you will soon see.
Let me see if the dial tone, which is provided by the phone, by the way, ever times out. This phone has built-in call progress detection, so it listens to see whether my call completes. We'll see whether it charges me for this no-answer call. That was a collect. Uh, I was talking softly into the earpiece to talk to the tape, so that may have confused it, but as you can see, it's not perfect. On the previous call to the busy signal, I had my money returned. Let me see if I can make a call that rings three times and not be charged for it. That was a coin return. So far, so good. Now I'm going to dial the same number again and let it ring three times. Boy, I hope he's home. You think he might not be there? Well, he should be there, you know. He said he was going to be there now. I hope he is. Uh, well, we'll see. And as you can guess, by commenting about my call going through while my call was going through, I made it appear to the machine that my call did go through and it charged me for that three ring call. Now, uh, let's get to the good part, long distance. Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes, uh, what choices do I have to pay for the call? Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Bell, and collector uh, cash. Uh, can I use my AT&T calling card? That'll do, sir. All right, uh, better yet, uh, let me pay for it here. Please hold. So that'll be a dollar and eighty cent for the first three minutes. All right, one moment. Can you return my money? Sure, hold on just a second. Okay, sir, you need to hang up and your money will return. All right, thank you. Thank you. That was the sound of a local call hanging up. 
In 1986, what's going to happen next is the line associated with this payphone is going to go back to dial tone. Just demonstrating for the tape about how it works, I just uh, demonstrated that obviously the operator is being connected through some sort of local call because 10 seconds after she hangs up, uh, the local line goes back to dial tone. I have to buzz off. I've got, I'm hanging out of my window. <laughs> All right. Have a good okay, time. Bye, bye Bye. That phone call to Les was free because the phone that I'm calling from called the operator on a local call, and in 1986, when a local call hangs up, you get a dial tone 10 seconds later. Eight, seven, four, three, eight, nine, five. That is the number of the outgoing line that this coin phone uses for all of its calls. Well, enough of this. You know, the ironic thing about these phones is, this is the first private payphone company I've seen that, for the most part, does everything legally. They're, uh, they seem to be in compliance with the tariff, and uh, they don't seem to be ripping people off. Sadly, it's that very um, way that they've complied with the tariffs and done it correctly that has left the system more vulnerable to fraud than other uh, similar private payphone systems. Indeed. In 1986, this really was a problem, especially for the Cocot people. Now, I don't usually defend the Cocot people. I was pretty annoyed with them lobbying the communications commissions to tack on that payphone charge to all of our long-distance calling cards made from payphones. But there was one thing that they lobbied for that really did sort of make sense. The problem was that in 1986, the network was set up so that when you dialed an outgoing call and stayed on the line after that call completed and then hung up, you would get another dial tone. Now for the actual Cocot phone, it was almost impossible to tell the difference between that second dial tone that's coming from a total reset of the phone line and a legitimate second dial tone that's coming from a customer calling some sort of a service, such as a long distance company, that gives you a second dial tone that the customer ought to be allowed to use. This is why in 1986 half the cocots out there would not allow you to use any second dial tone service, many would not allow you to use touch tones to control your answering machine, and all of that was an attempt to prevent the fraud that could so easily occur if an initial call completed and hung up and the line was allowed to go back to dial tone. Now here my first call was free because I was talking to the operator. All I had to do was stay on the line until the Cocot's phone line reset. And on that dial tone, I could dial any local call for free. This is not what the Cocot owners had in mind. This created a situation where the good Cocot companies, the ones that provided access to the things they were supposed to, were also opened up to fraud. Now, none of this works anymore because since 1986, the telephone network has That's been changed. changed. Is there an echo in here? Work seems dull, but concentrate on the larger issues and the day will pass more quickly. Hey, thanks for the advice. This is an 80s tape. I need all the help I can get. I hope it's not dull for everybody else. Boo! Oh, good. That was one of my longtime fans, obviously so inspired by this tape that he was just imitating a dial tone. Everybody else want to join in? Boo! Boo! Audience participation, this is great! Anyway, there was a fundamental network change lobbied for by the Cocot industry. And you know, of all the things they've lobbied for, this maybe was a good idea. For sure, it spoiled the 1990s freaking possibilities for a lot of people, but they changed the network so that everywhere, when you dial an outgoing call, and it answers, and it hangs up on you, you don't get another dial tone. Instead, you get the recording that says, please hang up and try your call again. 
And in that way, they made it so that cocots didn't have to worry about second dial tones. So none of this can be done today. Hey, 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 800, may I help you? Oh, what, is this 800 directory assistance? Yes. All right, I've gotten you by mistake. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye. The present temperature is 59 degrees. Eastern Standard Time. 2.52 exactly. cannot be completed as dialed from the phone you are using. Please read the instruction card or call your operator to help you. We're sorry. Your call cannot be completed as dialed from the phone you are using. Please read the instruction card or call your operator to help you. We're sorry. Very, very good. As you can see, the central office line that serves this phone is toll restricted, which of course works fine because all toll goes through these local calls to their operators, of which I will now make one more to a long distance directory systems bureau. Yes, I was trying to call uh, directory assistance in New York. I can't get through to it. Right. Please hold, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm calling uh, Directory Systems in New York. Area code two one two five 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 one two one two. Thank you. Thank you for using AT&T. Is that may help you? Yeah. What's the number for the main post office? You know, the big one, that thirty, you know, Eighth Avenue. General information is two one two nine six seven eight five eight eight. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, apparently NTS is new at this. Notice that the NTS operator gave me the regular AT&T Zero operator. Carte blanche. I could have asked the AT&T operator for anything, and she would have given it to me and not charged me for it, but charged NTS for it. In fact, 
I asked her for directory assistance, as I quite properly should have, and directory assistance ain't free. But NTS just paid for my directory assistance call. They should have gotten 50 cents from me before doing that. So I guess they're new at it. Let me uh, try this again and see whether this is their standard procedure. NTS operator, may I help you? Yeah, I'm trying to call directory assistance in Richmond. I can't get through. Richmond, Virginia. All right, so for long distance information, it would cost you 60 cents, please. All right, 60 cents? 60, yes, sir. All right. Note that that's 10 cents more than AT&T charges for the same call. Uh, no, AT&T's the same. They charge 60 cents also. Oh, have they gone up to 60? Uh-huh. Well, that's news for me. All right. <laughs> Let's see. I didn't know that. Yeah. All right, sir, and what area code is that, please? 804. 804. All right, just one moment, please. Yeah, uh, what's the number for the main post office in Richmond? The number is seven seven five six one one two. Seven seven five six one one two. If you need assistance, an operator will return. I'm through, thanks. company is this that they're using where 700-555-4141 goes through to a dial tone. That's unique.
Well, this didn't soup, I don't believe, so I don't believe I've got another NTS dial tone coming. Let's just make sure. Well, very interesting. Now we uh, know at least one of the numbers that they dial their calls out on. And uh, we saw what 700-555-4141 does. That, of course, is the number that's supposed to tell you what, uh, what your default uh, interlata carrier is. It ain't AT&T, that's for sure. Uh, and also, we're going to hear, we heard what will happen uh, when they actually collect your money, because she uh, collected my money for the uh, directory assistance call, which I assume now is going to fall into the box. I assume right. Okay, so this operator knew what she was doing. And AT&T directory assistance really is 60 cents. Now I'm home, and uh, here's what we've found out. 5243861 is a number that NTS operators dial out on. If you call the number, it rings. Um, I had it answer once, but obviously it is not the number that the coin phones call into when you make a long-distance call. We've heard the coin signals for collect and return, which are not the same as the ones used in the bell system, but are similar, just not exactly the same. I also know a great deal about how long-distance calls are handled. When you dial a long-distance call from one of these phones, the phone gives you an audible ring sound. Meanwhile, the phone is picking up and dialing some local number. I don't know what that local number is. I will find out later today. When the local number answers, the phone dials some sort of ID code that contains in it a 00001. I've heard that much in crosstalk. Uh, and then it dials the number you're calling. Then the phone cuts through the sound and the NTS system takes it from there. Now with some help I'll find out what the local number is. The second part of the recording is made from my home where I get less Les Reeves who unfortunately is no longer with us otherwise I'd bring him on and talk about it but he died in 2003. I get less to go out to the payphone and dial a few things while I'm at home recording, and we find out how those payphones actually get through to their operators for long distance. All right. Les has called me from the phone. You're in the leftmost phone. What's the number again? 8743571. Okay, before we do anything, let me just do this and see if it does anything, which I'm not necessarily expecting. Wait a minute, that's a seven, excuse me. Probably won't do anything because you dialed me locally. Now tell me that number again. Eight seven four three five seven one. All right, uh, hang up and I'll call you right back. Should I get my money back? I doubt it, but okay. it's worth a try. Here goes. one way to get me. <laughs> AT&T 800 stretch. Oh. I dialed it. I had it dial it on my line. I gave it a dial tone. Did the phone not ring? No, it won't ring. All it'll do is give you a dial tone. Well, worked okay. Uh, what did you have? When you rang in, did it not outpost so you gave it a dial tone? Correct. No. It picked up, hung up, picked up. This time I was smart enough to give it a dial tone and it <laughs> went on its way. 
So now let's find out what the local number is. Uh, dial just any zero plus call you want. You know, just do anything you want. Call me back? Uh, no, I need you to. I'm already calling you, so if you'll just oh, right, right, hang right, up hang and up. quickly dial it. Okay. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes, collect, please. All right, sir, and your name? Uh, Bill. All right, sir, please hold while I can let you call for you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You think you're on a private call, don't you? Would you like to try back? Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Well, thank you. That's a, uh, that's a busy signal that a certain PBX makes. Let me explain for the tape what I had to do. It got the dial tone from my other line and called up the access number. Then when the access number answered, the dial tone was not loud enough through my line tie for this phone to hear. So I quickly added on the number directly so it could hear the tone and continue. There apparently is some sort of ID number. Can you uh, move to the phone next to you? And uh, let me see if I can call you on that. What's the number on that phone? Eight seven four three eight nine five. By the way, that is that sound you're hearing that we were hearing that bip. Yeah. That's a camp phone from a ROM. Hmm, well, they may be using a ROM. Hold on. Is it ringing? No. You want me to answer it? Well, I'll tell you what. Oh, it's ringing. Oh, well, that's refreshing. Why does uh, this one not ring? <sighs> Damn if I know. Let's hang up completely and I'll start over. 8743895? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to call you on that phone. Alright. Alright, now what I want you to do... I just want to... There was one more thing. Something that's going to actually go through. Well, what's different about this phone than the other one? The other one won't ring. Maybe... Maybe the ringer detector doesn't work, and the ringer detector has to work before it can, you know, get out of dial tone mode and, and get on rings. Or that could well be. Uh, what I want you to do is uh, just just dial zero. Ask for directory assistance in New York area code two one two. Okay. Should I tell her I have trouble when she refuses? Yeah, okay. because it actually that phone doesn't let you dial it directly for some reason. Is it zero? Just dial zero. Yeah, just zero? dial zero. Right. Okay, now uh, immediately. Yeah, 490. The, the call failed. Is yes, there a... yes, operator, may I help you? Oh, yeah. Um, collect, please. All right, sir. And can I have the number you're dialing, please? Uh, y um, uh, yeah, you didn't get my number. Mm, well, it come up 404 790 uh, 0000. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Okay, and your name? Bill. All right, please hold while I can empty call for you. Thank you. You're welcome. What, zero alone didn't work before? Yeah, just give me a reorder. No, really? They don't want you to hear anything, do they? No. Sir? Yeah. Uh, well, I called 404 uh -huh. and they said they did not know a bill. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No one? You there? 
Yeah. What do you bet she paid for a call? Or they paid for a call? I bet so. <laughs> well, yeah, they probably... Of course, how can you arrange collect otherwise? Do you think they've got an arrangement with Southern Bell or something? I mean, to not do it through AT&T, how could they do it? They'd have to have their own sort well, of arrangement. Yeah, obviously. All right. Well, that's what they get for being in the operator business. There's a certain risk associated with those sort of calls. Yeah. All right. I want you to hit the hook switch and, you know, and dial zero. It won't work. Uh, well, if it doesn't work, then just... Uh, then just what? Uh, I don't know. Let me call you back All if right. it doesn't work. Pausing the tape for a moment, up until this point, all the coin sounds you've been hearing were from coins actually being deposited into the NTS phones. Now Les is going to deposit two real quarters, but from that point on, all of the coin sounds you hear will be from my handy dandy Yamaha DX7. It's 1986. This is my synth now. Okay, so it's Michael McDonald's DX7. I didn't have a handy recording of mine, but it's my DX7 that's going to be making the dime after less as two quarters. Actually, it's a virtual dime. That's what we're going to be snickering about, and I'm also using that to make the MF tones to return Les's coin. some sort of ID. Mm. Go ahead and put in the money and everything. For what? For directory assistance. You got 60? Yeah, I need to get directory assistance in okay. New York. Okay, you need to deposit 60 cents so I can go ahead and connect you. Okay. failed. Maybe it fails a lot. Uh, but it's not going to time out. Because it never went off hook. Hold on, let me make sure your money's going to come back. <laughs> What's it trying to do? It just grounded my line. Yeah, I just, I just sent a coin return. But it didn't return my money. No, it doesn't. It'll, for what some... Does it ground the line at that point for? I can't imagine. Oh, it's doing a coin test. That's the only point of reason you'd ground a line, is to check the totalizer. But why does it care? Well, who knows? That may have something to do with the logic of the phone. What did you send it? Code 11. Where is... Oh, oh let, me get, let me get them off the line. This is nice. We're on our own private call, and the phone thinks we're on a call to their operator. Okay. I thought I could hear the relay actually detecting the code 11, but it's actually just the relay that, that jolts the line or grounds the line. Hmm. Isn't that a trip? <laughs> okay, so presumably now it's latched me up for a coin return, I suppose. I think so. I, I think the way it may work... Now I can collect your money, too, if you'd like no, me to. No, <laughs> I need my 50 cents back. <laughs> Just a minute, I'll connect you. What area code is that? <laughs> now, wonder, would it have collected... Uh, see, their their procedure is very inconsistent. They're poorly trained. First time I called directory assistance, the operator just gave me the AT&T operator, who I could have asked for anything. He just picked up the phone and dialed zero and let me have her. Second time, the operator wanted me to put in the money and collected it, or sent the collect tone. The third time, uh, this time, she wanted the money, but she didn't send the collect tone. So how that works, damn if I know. 
Okay, have you checked this thing for 950s and ringback codes and all sorts of other silly silliness like that? 950 is like any other local call. Porter? Yeah. Uh, it gets its uh, local calls, it determines whether to collect or not by listening, and it's very easy to make it think the call has gone through when it hasn't. So. Well, is it very easy to make it think it hadn't gone through when it has? No. <laughs> I gotta go, I'm freezing to death. All right. Let me just. You know, I guess there's really nothing else I need to know. I can certainly take it from here now. You got all the digits? Uh, well, I'll check the ID. It'll. All right. Okay. I'll call you. Bye. Bye. That's all for this segment, but this continues in the next one. In the next segment, so that you can get one of the giggles that Les and I have, I have to explain to you what SIGI is. SIGI was a security device that was installed. In the late 70s, well, there were several incarnations of it, but we first found out about it in 1983, and I have a conversation with Joe Ingressia, who is giving us the scoop.